How will we power our future? Can we create a healthy and clean economy? Climate One at the Commonwealth Club is at the forefront of the global debate about energy, economy, and the environment. Bringing together the brightest and most provocative leaders of our time, Climate One is the place where big ideas get heard. With thoughtful and insightful discussions on policy, business, science, and culture, Climate One founder Greg Dalton gets to the heart of the matter. It's our future. It's time to come together. Mary Nichols has been called everything from Trump's nemesis to the most influential environmental regulator of all time. In her 45-year career in state and federal government, Nichols has taken on automakers and collaborated with them. Environmentalists have cheered her moves to cut greenhouse gas emissions, occasionally criticizing her for letting polluters off easy and not doing enough for disadvantaged communities of color. Where does California's climate leadership go from here? And what's ahead for a new national climate agenda? Join us for a conversation on the storied career of Mary Nichols, chair of the California Air Resources Board, and a look at California's ambitious and controversial climate leadership from Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger to Governor Gavin Newsom. In 2008, shortly after you took over chair of the Air Board, I vividly remember being in a, a glitzy Beverly Hills hotel at a, a summit that Governor Schwarzenegger put on. Uh, Barack Obama had just been uh, elected. He addressed the group by video. I had never seen a standing ovation for a video before. And he said uh, that, you know, people who care about climate change now have a friend in the White House. And there, there were cheers. And his future Secretary of Defense, Leon Panetta, spoke there. So take us back to that moment when, when similar to now, there was some a lot of um, expectations and excitement about climate progress in 2008. Well, yes, and similar to now, we also were coming out of an era when the federal government had been fighting against California and uh, working very actively uh, through EPA and the courts to deny California the right to set uh, emission standards for vehicles uh, for the greenhouse gases that are emitted by vehicles. So lo and behold, we're facing the same issue again. It's a, it's a repeat of that experience where we now have a new administration coming in, this time with an even broader set of commitments and uh, frankly, I think a much longer list, a bigger bench of people that they're looking at for top positions across the government who get it that climate is uh, a major issue for our time. Uh, another difference, I think, which is significant is that we know that um, this election was propelled in significant part by young voters and that um, climate is one of their top issues. So uh, politically, climate has become relevant in a way that it wasn't before. Now, you mentioned top government officials in the Biden administration. You're on the short list to run EPA. I know uh, you, you, you're not sure if that's good, you're going to get that call. But what do you think the next EPA administrator should do after we've had four years of, the, of really demoralized staff at the EPA, a lot of rollbacks? It's been really, really tough time for that agency. Budget cuts, staff cuts, you name it. Yeah, EPA has really been hollowed out. Uh, there are many vacant positions and many strong people with experience and knowledge and commitment left because they just couldn't stand the uh, political leadership that was trying to subvert the very mission of the agency. Uh, to me, restoring EPA's integrity and its competence is a key element of the administration being able to meet its climate goals. Because while it certainly isn't enough uh, to take on the breadth of this problem, the Clean Air Act remains the single best legal tool that we have to regulate the sources and causes of climate change. And it certainly is one important ingredient, especially when it comes to motor vehicles. I think though for the agency as a whole, because even though clean air is usually the thing that gets the most attention. There are many other important programs uh, at EPA, not least of which is clean water, providing safe drinking water and fishable, swimmable rivers, uh, dealing with polluted landscapes around the country, toxic chemicals. These are all part of the agency's mission. Uh, but when it comes to the entire agency, the number one, um, I think, 
uh, platform on which it has to stand is the role of science, that decisions are made for the protection of health and the environment, and they're made based on the best best available science, and the agency itself helps to participate in going out and gathering that kind of science. They may not do all the studies themselves, they couldn't, but they can do some, and they can work with people in the academic community, in the think tanks who are doing the science, and they can sift through it and present the best of it for decision makers to act on. I remember there was a Bloomberg conference, I think it was last year, where uh, Andrew Wheeler, e EPA administrator, was there. I interviewed him. You met with him separately at that same conference. What was that sitting down, like sitting down with him at the point where he was saying that uh, fuel efficiency increases uh, would cost consumers money more on because the purchase of the car would be higher. I think you probably said that uh, consumers with higher efficiency vehicles, they'll save money on gasoline over the life of the car. What was that like sitting down with Andrew Wheeler one on one? <laughs> well, I mean, in the public meeting, we had a flat disagreement about the facts. Uh, he didn't back down. And of course, I didn't back down either. I think I won on points in terms of the information that I was able to marshal. But uh, afterwards, there was a luncheon at these conferences. The Bloomberg people always invite all the speakers and other poobahs that are there to come and have lunch. And so um, he got there before I did and there was an empty seat uh, next to him. So I went over and sat down next to him um, and I just had a chat with him about hiking and various other things. We didn't talk about the issues at all because when you've got somebody whose mind is that set, okay. my experience is particularly in a setting where there were other people around eagerly hanging on this conversation, there's just no point thinking you're going to get anywhere with uh, any kind of an argument. Then this actually, this split uh, the auto industry. Some companies sided with California, some companies sided with the Trump administration. How did that play out? And what does that bring us to today where some companies uh, basically sided with a relaxed rule, some companies sided with California? How did that shake out? Well, first of all, um, there was a period of time during which supposedly the administration was going to try to negotiate with California to see if we could come up with a compromise between zero and the California uh, regulations. That did not work out, and there's a long, twisted history about that. But essentially, uh, the administration was not talking to the industry or labor or consumers or anybody else. They just started from a position which was an ideological position that there should not be any use of these uh, emission standards that might impact on fuel economy. So they, they weren't interested in having a real conversation. Uh, when that became clear and we reverted to um, litigation mode, uh, the companies faced a choice. They could either side with the administration or stay out or they could throw in their lot with California. And um, as I think everybody knows, General Motors and Toyota, who were the big dogs in the trade association, swung their weight behind joining with the Trump administration. Um, there, they had arguments uh, that they made, you know, in private as well as in public that basically boiled down to the fact that they felt like they were being pressured by the Trump administration into siding with them. And they felt that they were potentially at risk because uh, the president has other tools at his disposal um, in terms of trade sanctions and uh, rulings on various labor and health issues and so forth, in which he could have made their lives much, much more difficult. And so they wanted to be siding with the federal government. Uh, and they had lawyers advising them that this might be their big opportunity to escape from the uh, heavy hand of California regulations as well. So the, their public argument was that they in, intervened in the litigation because they wanted a seat at the table. But they all, uh, those that, that joined the litigation, 
took the position that uh, California shouldn't be allowed to set emission standards for greenhouse gases. Uh, over time, some of the companies that did not support that position, this was a vote within the trade organization. And while their voting may not be quite as complex as the uh, electoral college, it's, you know, it's a complicated weighting vote, weighted voting system. Some of the companies that didn't support this idea approached California to see if there was a way that they could uh, work around that. And eventually what happened was uh, that we uh, did negotiate a framework agreement, which was a, a compromise between no further improvements and the California only regulation, which we believed would get to the same overall benefit in terms of reduced uh, greenhouse gases if the companies would uh, apply it on a nationwide basis. And so led by Ford Motor Company, uh, but also with the uh, you know, strong leadership and support from uh, from Honda and BMW and Volkswagen, eventually Audi and Volvo, um, we arrived at this uh, voluntary agreement, uh, which is like an enforceable contract with these companies, whereby they agreed to meet a higher standard across their whole national sales fleet and, uh, and to uh, not... Uh, not attack California's legal jurisdiction here. Uh, and I, I do think there's a common thread here in terms of my involvement, which is that it's about the it's about the merits. It's about getting the results and the and the environmental benefits, but it's also about protecting California's right to set standards because that has been time and time again the one tool that we, the people as a whole, have had to really force progress on the part of uh, a part of the industry. Richard, the listener, writes, what with control of the Senate in Republican hands, can anything be done on climate? Well, first of all, as we um, are having this conversation, um, the control of uh, the Senate is not yet in Republican hands, although Mitch McConnell may believe it's going to be. Uh, there's many uh, forces at work and people who believe that uh, the two seats that are still in contention are going to go to Democrats, which would then uh, change the leadership completely. But the Senate is a, you know, it's a, it's a pretty uh, slow moving body in general. Um, the House is a lot more of an activist institution as our constitution has set it up. And they have been passing legislation and resolutions that make it clear that they intend to move on climate. And uh, I believe that they will uh, they will succeed in passing legislation. But I think it's really important to recognize, as the Biden administration is already showing, that um, climate action is not just about one particular law. In fact, there probably are you know, 10 laws that need to be changed or passed in order to get a grip on a problem that is so pervasive as the role of carbon emissions and greenhouse gas emissions uh, in our economy. However, if you look at um, the Department of Energy, the Department of Defense, the Department of Interior, the Department of Agriculture, Commerce, they all have a role to play through the missions that they are responsible for in shifting gears in the direction of reducing our impact on climate and making our whole uh, uh, society more resilient uh, in the face of the climate change that's already occurring. So um, this is a, it's, it's a huge undertaking, but it doesn't, uh, and it certainly should have, deserves to have, and I believe ultimately will have bipartisan support. But I don't think you can just look at the makeup right now and say, well, you'll never get anything passed, because I don't, I don't think that's true. Uh, another question from a listener, uh, that if you were appointed climate czar, which uh, Vice President, uh, President-elect Biden has talked about some kind of climate leader, uh, President Obama had one, um, if he named you climate czar, what would be your top five priorities? And how would you convince the public that these policies would be beneficial to our economy? Well, first of all, uh, I, I would not... Uh, 
be the best candidate to be the climate czar because my ancestors left Russia to get away from the czars. And I've never really accepted that as a as a good title, but uh, not to be facetious. But um, I do think that there should be somebody in the White House who leads the effort, as I said before, because it's so complicated and responsibility is spread all over the government. You really do need a strong uh, White House presence to make sure that everybody is pulling in the same direction and they're all collaborating, cooperating across the board. Uh, so that's kind of the process question. But in terms of what are the first things that should be done, um, certainly putting a stop to the war on uh, any kind of climate change action has got to be the number one thing. The, the scrubbing of any mention of climate change from everything from the uh, National Environmental Policy Act to websites for, uh, from NASA, uh, it's shameful. That is just shameful. And that has got to stop. Um, once we begin to recognize what the what the science already shows, what the data show us, then I think we have to move in the direction of um, accelerating the recovery of our country from the COVID uh, virus to uh, put money uh, and find money to put into uh, building back uh, our infrastructure and providing stimulus in ways that support the transition to clean fuels, uh, clean energy, electrification of the transportation system. There's a need for some new technologies out there for sure, um, but there's also a lot that can be done with just accelerating the, the role. Um, the Obama administration did a lot when they were faced with a recession uh, to bring in a new era of solar energy and help to create a whole new American business that brought down the costs for consumers and created good jobs for people in manufacturing and installation of uh, solar facilities. And uh, we can do that again. And this time it's going to be easier because the um, uh, the current crisis is not one in which the banks have failed or there's lack of investors out there. We have private sector investors, venture capitalists, banks, et cetera, that will invest um, once people are able to go back to work. So uh, I think there's, uh, there's going to be a resurgence of activity around the clean tech and uh, green technology uh, uh, space. And um, I'm excited to see it all beginning to unfold. Climate was an issue in this presidential election season more than any before. It made to the debate stage. It was thanks to Sunrise Movement and others uh, and also a growing national consensus. F climate change was on the agenda more than before. Fracking was part of that. Uh, there's some talk about whether the new administration will ban fracking on public lands, what they should do about it. What's your position on fracking? Is it something to be banned as some environmentalists would like or should be more closely regulated? It's regulated at the state level. But how should, it's, how should we approach fracking? Well, the federal government does have a responsibility for protecting federal lands, and, and, and they need to do that, um, whether it's through a blanket ban or more likely a somewhat more um, focused, uh, you know, on different areas. I think in general, there's got to be a, a change in philosophy from the you know, let's just drill everything um, philosophy, which, by the way, as a parting shot, I believe the president is now trying to open up both more of Alaska and offshore California for oil drilling. So you know, we have a long history of fighting that one. That's, I think this is where I came in when I moved to California in 1971, was they were battling over, uh, over offshore oil platforms. But um, the... I think that the uh, uh, question of what happens on private land is more complicated. In California, uh, we need legislation to actually ban fracking. It's a technique that has been used for oil development in the state for many years, and it has it has different uh, effects. It's no question it 
it has effects on people who live near any kind of oil development activities, that there's water and air impacts and there need to be protections for humans uh, from this activity. But overall, the goal has got to be reducing our dependence on petroleum, whether it's imported or produced domestically. Um, we just need to be using less of it. And then I think you can phase down the development because uh, as happened with coal, it becomes uneconomic if people are not burning the stuff. You know, individuals say, what can I do? And there's quite a debate. Some people will say policy is what matters Pol because climate is so big. Policy, policy, policy. We need policy. And other people will say, hey, individual action is important, incremental. I want to do the right thing. What do you, where do you come down on the individual action kind of spectrum in terms of is it significant or is it a distraction that away from the bigger systemic things? Individual action is um not a distraction. In fact, it's essential. Um, if people are not interested in the topic, even if you have leaders at the very top who are saying, yes, we want to take action, they won't get the support that they need. And I think we've seen uh, certainly in the United States and in other, in other democratic societies that um, change flows from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. not from the top down. You have to have people who are willing and able to buy the cleaner vehicles, to invest in the new technologies, and to um, move to places that are less dependent on having to drive long distances. You know, you've got to change the economy and the marketplace, and that requires action on the part of the people as they are acting as consumers, as citizens at the local level and who they elect, but also just the choices they make of what to buy and, and how to live. Um, without that, the politicians, even if they may articulate the vision, are not going to have the ability to actually move forward and make policy. It's a, But it's interactive. Again, as we've seen um, most recently with this um, response or lack of response to the COVID uh, crisis in our country, if you don't have national leaders who are willing to set policy and say, wear a mask, uh, then you also uh, don't get cooperation from the people because it's not seen as something that's important. It becomes, it becomes an issue for debate and therefore um, the problem just gets worse. So you, it, it's really not an either or discussion. It has to be both. Right, it's about the buy-in, more less so I'm hearing you saying than the actual carbon reductions, but about it's the support, the buy-in, and, and part of uh, the fabric. Well, I mean, individual actions uh, do matter. They do add up in terms of actual tons reduced as well. I'm not saying it's only about attitudes, uh, but, uh, but it, it takes a lot of individual actions to add up to the kind of tons that you can get when you convert one power plant from coal uh, to renewables. As we wrap up, we began talking about AB 32, California's landmark climate law, which uh, had the goal, required goal of reducing emissions to 1990 levels by 2020. California, I believe, met that even a little early. But the outlook for the goals going ahead the next 10 years are less rosy. There's some, been some recent projections that California's gonna have a really hard time meeting its goals of the next decade. So could you address that? That a lot of the, uh, so there's some concern that a lot of the low hanging fruit has been picked and the next 10 years may be harder than the last 10 years in terms of driving deeper decarbonization. You know, um, having started my career working on air pollution back in the 1970s, I have heard this argument every time the standards got tighter or stricter, that uh, all the low-hanging fruit is gone, everything that was affordable has been done, the next 
uh, slice is going to be way more expensive and way too difficult. Uh, and every time that argument has come up, we have continued to move forward in the direction of our clean air goals set based on health needs. And we have achieved them because technology rises to meet the challenge. It is a, a fact of life, which um, I think some people have a hard time accepting that if you set strong standards and you create the conditions in which people can make money by developing and marketing the technologies that will help you meet those standards, you can do it. You keep on moving forward towards the direction of cleaner air, and we will keep on doing the same thing uh, as we not only clean up the air, but reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. It's not that it's easy. It, is, it, it isn't that there's something there just waiting to be done that's free and gosh, why hasn't just already been done? But if you have a choice in buying a new uh, urban bus or a choice in um, where your electricity is coming from and it arrives at, at, your, at your home or your workplace when you need it and is affordable, um, you don't really care uh, what power plant actually generated those electrons. And this is the beauty of our system is that we have been able time and time again to find and use and reward uh, those who have come along with cleaner, better technologies for creating electricity, creating uh, cleaner fuels. Uh, I, I don't want to, you know, go too much into the ancient history, but when I first started working on air pollution, the power plants in the Los Angeles basin burned fuel oil. It was 3% sulfur fuel oil. It was, by today's standards, completely unacceptable. And we fought with the utilities for years and made the switch from uh, fuel oil to natural gas. And now, decades later, we're moving away from natural gas and in the direction of renewables. Um, each time there's been some resistance, it's not always uh, been a straight line, you know, quick, easy change. And it did require policy uh, to make it happen. But once the policy was there and people accepted that it was needed, uh, we got the we got the results that that we needed. Podcasts of this and other Climate One shows are available wherever you get your pods. Please help us get more people talking about climate by telling a friend, giving us a rating or review. It really does help advance the conversation. Thanks for joining us online. Thanks to Mary Nichols. We'll see you next time, everybody.